Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ag Next podcast. We're always excited to tell you about what's next from Ag Next. Today is exciting. First of all, it's Leap Day, which is really cool. Um, but second of all, it is our listener's choice episode. So thank you to everybody who um, jumped on our um, social media channels and shared your votes. Um, so today, we're going to be talking about methane mitigation opportunities for beef and dairy. What's out there? Let's get into it. <music> Welcome, Dr. Place, to the Agnex podcast. Thanks for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, folks are excited to hear from you about uh, methane mitigation and right. what opportunities are out there for beef and dairy. So, so that's what we're going to chat about today. Perfect. Yes. So, Sarah, the first question is why mitigate methane and what does it represent at the greenhouse and U.S. globally? And can you just expand on that? A yeah. Bit? Yeah. So, to even probably start. More basic, right? Yeah. If we think about methane, it's one of the greenhouse gas emissions that can have a warming effect mm -hmm. in our atmosphere, right? We always think about it as kind of the second most important from human activities. So carbon mm -hmm. dioxide is the most important, and then methane has basically the second most amount of warming. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we're concerned about it and we want to mitigate emissions is because the concentrations of methane have gone up in the atmosphere. So... Mm -hmm. We're hovering around like 1.9 parts per million right now. So it's a really small amount in the atmosphere, but it's mm -hmm. basically almost doubled since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. So that's why we're interested in, okay, if the concentration is increasing the atmosphere, what can we do to mm -hmm. mitigate the emissions that are adding to that? Um, and so when we think about like the percentages of it globally, globally it's around 16% of greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. When you use a global warming 100 uh, uh -huh. value, which we could get into that, right? The different mm -hmm. ways we can account for it. And then in the U.S., it's around 11% of our emissions is methane. The majority of our emissions in the world and in the United States are carbon dioxide. So again, keep in mind, that's where methane is ranking is number two. And those metrics that you shared, is there like a governing body who supports that data? Yeah. Yeah. So that would be both kind of the data from the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the US EPA. So the okay. Environmental Protection Agency kind of summarizes and tries to estimate our greenhouse gas emissions inventory from all activities in the United States every year. Okay, cool. Okay. And 11% and US, 16% globally. So why, why should we mitigate and cattle more yeah, specifically. Yeah. yeah, so cattle would be one subset of that, mm -hmm. say, within the United States, 11%. Um, so basically you go from that 11% and then break it down into different even, categories. Even smaller okay. percent, right? The biggest chunk, and kind of like why we do a lot of research on enteric fermentation, which is the methane that's naturally produced from ruminant animals, including cattle, is about 3.1% of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions, right? So it's the actual biggest chunk of all the methane sources, of all the variety of sources that are there from like oil and natural gas to other, you know, sources. But animal ag in terms of enteric fermentation is the largest right. source. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is context setting, only 3.1% mm -hmm. okay. of the total. What are some of the ways that methane can be measured? Yeah. And kind of what are you doing here at Agnext yeah, in, yeah. in our facility? Yes. So there's different ways to measure methane emissions um, from cattle specifically, right? So we could talk up all day about all the different ways that methane yeah. gets measured mm -hmm. from different systems. But if we're just talking about cattle and just talking about enteric fermentation, which again is that big biggest source, um, there's different methods where you can try to estimate methane emissions from animals mm -hmm. or measure methane emissions. And so the key principles for all those systems is like you have to be able to measure the concentration of the gas really accurately. So you need to have good gas analyzers. Mm -hmm. And then typically you're putting an animal in some sort of setting where you can measure the flow rate of air around the animal or around its face or head, because that's always the fun fact, right? Most of that methane is coming out the front end of the animal. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great point, right? Yeah. Just to be clear. It's cow burps. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, that's the setup that we have at the Climate Smart Research Facility, yeah. right? Yeah. So my familiarity with systems has typically always been that where we kind of just ignore anything that comes out the back end of the animal and we just look at the mm -hmm. front end. Um, so whether what we call head box systems or 
the green feed systems that we use, which are kind of like head boxes, but they're just open. So mm-hmm. for folks to kind of imagine, right, it's basically a feeder the animal can walk up to mm-hmm. and consume some feed from. And while they're there, there's this pump that's pulling air from around the animal's face all the time. Mm-hmm. And so we know the flow rate of the air around the animal's head. And then we measure the concentration of the gas that's coming out. Um, and we also know the background concentration of methane. So back to that 1.9. Uh, Mm -hmm. value of parts per million Um, and by knowing the difference of the two in the flow rate we can calculate an emission rate which is mass or volume per unit time for the animal Um, so it's it's rather complicated sometimes Mm -hmm. people think you can just measure methane itself right the concentration of methane but you need to know that flow rate part to actually get an emission rate so when we do all this type of work whether it's using green feeds or other systems it's involved and it's a little bit of ag engineering along with um, animal science to do that. Okay, that's a great point. So basically, and most of the methane that the cattle is producing is coming from the front end, right? Yes. And that's that's the that's the topic that our listeners choose is how to mitigate methane from beef and dairy industry. Like, what are the what are the ways that we can do to mitigate that that methane that's coming out, the enteric methane that's coming out from beef and dairy? Yeah. Yeah, so we can think about it in a couple different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, We can think about trying to mitigate the total emissions from the industry. There's a few factors there you can think about as, well, how many cattle do we have? Mm -hmm. And for beef and dairy, how many are needed to produce a given amount of beef or milk? So Mm -hmm. one of the ways that the industry has mitigated emissions, say per unit of beef or per unit of milk, is by getting more efficient over time. Mm -hmm. And so we don't need as many cattle to produce the same amount of beef and milk. So just even compared to like 1975 to now, there's roughly about 40 million fewer cattle in the Mm -hmm. United States. So that obviously is a big quote unquote methane savings, even though we're actually producing far more milk and beef in the U S now. And so that's just happened because we got more efficient. So it's kind of an indirect way, but sometimes that's the most powerful lever to pull, Mm -hmm. right? To mitigate methane emissions is just, the work that cattle producers do to become more efficient every single day through animal nutrition, better genetics, mm-hmm. better reproductive performance, all those type of things. Mm-hmm. Then there are ways to try to directly mitigate it, okay. meaning per animal per day. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can think about a lot of things that happen basically of trying to mitigate the room and environment. Right? Mm-hmm. So that's always kind of like to step back. Cattle don't produce methane, right? Yes, Microbes a- produce methane. Mm-hmm. Say a little more about that. <laughs> that's a great point. Yeah. yeah. Just talk a little more about that. Yeah. So cattle, they're ruminant animals, right? Um, which means they're awesome because I think ruminants <laughs> are really cool. <laughs> they're awesome. Yeah. And so they don't have a stomach like us, right? Mm-hmm. Where we just have kind of this acidic environment and that's where our food first goes. They have a much larger stomach that has four compartments. Yeah. I feel like much, you mentioned once it's like the size of a bathtub. It can be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah especially like a for, animal. Yeah, especially oh, wow. for like a dairy cow, right? Yeah. They, it could be like... That's what you can imagine. The yeah. volume of your bathtub is like how big their stomach is. Oh, wow. Um, and so in that stomach is just filled with all sorts of material. Of course, the animal eats mm-hmm. hay, grains, all those mixtures of feeds mm-hmm. that we feed animals. And that grows all these bacteria, mm-hmm. protozoa, fungi, yep. um, and a little subclass of organisms that are called methanogens. Mm-hmm. So they're actually... Archaea, methanogenic okay. archaea, mm-hmm. which is this is you know they get really into it. We are no. really in it now. It's one of the three we domains deep, of deep life in the room. And, you yes. know, <laughs> anyways. So methanogens, they're they're named pretty good, right? Uh-huh. Because they generate methane, um, and so they're a class of those basically rumen bugs, and they produce methane from the end products of other microbes mm-hmm. in the rumen, right? So the other microbes will be fermenting feed producing things like carbon dioxide and hydrogen and those methanogens take those up and use them for their own life processes. Mm -hmm. And the byproduct of that is methane. So the cow's just sitting there. She has no idea all this stuff is happening, right? She benefits from these microbes. Yeah. They digest her feed for her Mm -hmm. and she gets nutritional value from them, but she's not producing the methane. The uh, freeloaders that are living inside of her are producing the methane basically. (laughs) Yeah. 
So it's super easy, right? Just yeah, it's stop. super easy. Yeah, so <laughs> no. yeah, it's not hard to feed cattle, right, Pedro? Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's always a challenge, right? You're feeding the microbes, Oops. and then the microbes are feeding the animal. And so then we add to that mix of like we have this hugely complex ecosystem in mm-hmm. the rumen that, yes. you know, just one milliliter of rumen fluid has more microbes in it than there are human beings on Earth, right? Just to give you an idea of like the diversity and what's happening there. It's a planet inside an animal, right? Exactly. So yeah. Or multiple planets, multiple right? Multiple planets. Within yeah. a within a animal. Yeah. And so then we can try to do things to change how that ecosystem is functioning with the end product of hopefully less methane, mm-hmm. right? And there are things we know that we probably can do, mm-hmm. right, that will affect that. Mm-hmm. Um, the number one thing we do, especially in the beef cattle industry, is when we feed cattle higher grain mm-hmm. diets, we that's actually lower methane emissions, right? That's a great point, yeah. Um, and we see that even in some of the data that we've collected where we've measured animals multiple times. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a great point because yeah. the environment that, that grain creates is not that fair of favorable to those type of bacteria, right? Yes, exactly. So the the simple way to put it is there's less of the food for the methanogens available. Yes. Right? So there's less hydrogen gas specifically for them to munch on to make methane. Mm-hmm. So they they can't make as much methane, mm-hmm. right? Um, we care about that. And the reason we feed high green diets is because it makes the animal more efficient at yes. converting feed into gain because mm-hmm. methane is a loss of calories basically from the animal's diet. So... Mm-hmm. It's kind of a dual purpose thing of trying to reduce methane to try to improve the efficiency of animals and also the climate impacts of methane. That's that's great. So then what are the what are the more specific ways? So we talked about switching yeah. we talked about switching animals to a grain based diet or moving them into the finishing phase. Um, but I know that there's a lot of talk about new exciting opportunities that are on the horizon that maybe aren't quite market ready yet, but we'd love to hear about what are other options for um, yeah. mitigating uh, methane and beef specifically. Yeah. So there are some things that we have available to us today that we assume, and we hope to do more research on those topics, such as like supplementing fat for mm-hmm. um, ruminant diets. And one thing to think in mind is actually ruminants, they eat a low fat diet all the time, right? We mm-hmm. talk about that in humans, but they're yeah. always eating a pretty low fat diet. Um, And when we talk about supplementing fat, we mean just increasing just a few percentage points, the amount of fat in their diet. That can actually mitigate methane emissions, it's been shown. How we process grain can influence it too, Mm -hmm. right? So if we go from, you know, if we are feeding corn grain in a diet or any type of grain, and all we do is take that, like, say, kernel of corn, and we just dry roll it or crack it, um, we increase the surface area for those little rumen bugs to do their thing and mm-hmm. attach to it and ferment it. Mm-hmm. But if we do something like steam flake the corn, which was a technology that was developed here at CSU, mm-hmm. um, we increase that surface area and the ab- availability of the starch in that kernel of corn oh, okay. a lot more. Um, and it is like corn flakes, right, like yeah. that we would eat. Um, and that can actually lower methane emissions, so there's been some yeah. evidence of that too. Is it because it's easier to digest? Yeah. For the so it's back to back to that same concept of we're hopefully providing less food for the methanogens at the end of that process. Okay. Yep. 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 So those are some of the things we can do now. But then, of course, yeah, there's a lot more interest in some of these things that are, you know, disclaimer, they're not really available at commercial scale mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. the United States. Um, one is, of course, people have heard about, like, seaweed, yep. and specifically a type of seaweed, um, Asparagopsis taxformis mm. is the species that will, um, or has been shown in some experiments to reduce methane emissions. And, and that, now you're changing a little bit because now are you targeting that specific bacteria now? Or what, what, is, what are those feed additives, I would say? Yeah, what does the seaweed do? Great yeah. question. <laughs> yeah. So what we think the main effect is, is yeah, there's a uh, compound in that seaweed Mm-hmm. that is called bromoform mm-hmm. that will directly impact the methanogens in their methane production or methanogenesis process. So now instead of kind of indirectly affecting the foodstuffs, if you will, for the methanogens, we're really going after them directly. So there's been some research using those products that would say pretty dramatic reductions, mm-hmm. 80%. Where's most, of, where's most of that research come from? So it really started in Australia. Australia, okay. Yeah. Um, basically some researchers there kind of screened a whole bunch of seaweed mm-hmm. species in vitro first, meaning kind of like in a test tube environment first. Mm-hmm. 
and found that was the most promising. And then in the last several years, that work has gone into live animals mm-hmm. research. So a lot of it's been done in Australia, continues to be done there, and then also in California. Mm-hmm. So Dr. Mays Kabrab at UC Davis has done a lot of that work with mm-hmm. both dairy cows and beef cattle. Mm-hmm. And then some at Penn State. Penn State, yeah. Your alma mater, right, yep. has done some of that we work. Are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Um, go Lions. And yeah, so that's where a lot of the work has been been done. So, so there needs sea- oh, sorry, seaweed. Yeah, yeah. Seaweed's yeah. one option. One option, but and again, the, the key thing there is it's there's still a lot of questions, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So there's been research that's been done, but there's still not that many animals and that have been evaluated. Um, and the big thing with mitigating methane is we always want to, of course, ensure the safety of the animal, the safety of the products that result yeah. from the animal. Mm-hmm. And, of course, knowing and understanding, does this affect animal performance positively or negatively? Mm-hmm. So some of those mm-hmm. issues still need to be sussed out. And, and I think another challenge, Sarah, like you mentioned, like multiple planets inside an animal, right? So what about the variation among oh, animals, yeah. that, that's that's also yeah. another challenge, right? Like, are yes. you going to spawn the same in different environments? Challenge and an opportunity, right? So, right. yeah, we yeah we like to talk about things like means and like, uh, you know, just back to the methane yeah. stats, it's 11%. But, of course, it's 11% plus or minus, right? Because yeah. everything is, is variable. Um, and so same with, with cattle, right? We may feed the same dose of whatever active compound we're feeding and expect to affect those methanogens mm-hmm. in the same mm-hmm. way. But individual animals may vary, right, in their response. And some of the methane inhibitors, uh, other products that are out there in development, definitely respond differently depending on what the diet is the animal's mm-hmm. consuming, mm-hmm. which is kind of a reflection of what microbial world yeah. was w- within them right mm-hmm. so that would be another one of those products that's uh, an inhibitor it would be three nitroxypropanol which mm-hmm. of course just runs runs right off the tongue right yeah. commonly known as three nop <laughs> yes <laughs> exactly um so that's a more synthetic compound that's actually been developed by the company dsm mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so the inventor of that um compound mike kinderman um really started about looking at that whole methanogen process and understanding the different enzymes in that process of producing methane mm-hmm. and basically doing like kind of computer modeling first to think about how could I block, you know, this key enzyme that is the one that's in charge of making mm-hmm. the methane. And so that's where this three and OP compound came from was kind of doing those computer experiments first, understanding the 3D structure of that mm-hmm. compound and then saying, you know, we expect this will probably work. Mm-hmm. And then they've done tremendous amounts of research across the world on that compound. Mm-hmm. Um, back to the microbial worlds, what's been found is, one, there's a dose response. So the more you feed, the more percent reduction you get. Mm-hmm. But also, the more fiber in general in the animal's diet, the less effective it is. Oh, interesting. interesting. So it's not the same across diets. So let's say the stars are aligned. You've got the perfect diet. You've got the perfect dose. What's the target for reduction? If you could ballpark it. Yeah. Just assuming. Mm -hmm. It depends. Or what the, what the data says, right? What's the, what do the studies say? Like how effective is it? So with finished cattle, Mm -hmm. beef cattle that we tend to feed lower fiber diets with, Mm -hmm. the range of reduction is usually 50% plus. So when we're talking about 3NOP, where are the places that this product is commercially available? Yeah, so there's places where it's approved, right, Mm -hmm. and can be fed right now. So that includes countries like Canada, the European Union. And Canada's fairly recent. Canada's in the last month that it's gotten that approval. Yeah. Brazil, Chile. Um, But in the United States, it's not yet approved. Not currently approved by the FDA. By the FDA, exactly. Okay. So there is no... um, FDA approved feed additive to reduce enteric methane from ruminants. Okay. In the United States. That's yep. always an important, yeah. So but it's good to baseline. What does that yeah. mean? So that means for producers, right, if they're asked to like, hey, can you reduce methane emissions? Some of those things that we talked about before of like, well, we know we can kind of probably work around the edges with mm-hmm. some of these other dietary interventions, but there's no inhibitors that make currently and that make large okay. reductions. Mm-hmm. So like you mentioned, the seaweed, neither the three NOP is not available. Nope. So yeah. now we're just using the known strategies that we have. Yes, exactly. And then your work at Agnex is also exploring 
additional opportunities yeah. for reduction, right? Yeah. So one is kind of trying to validate some of those things that we think already affect methane and say, do they do they actually work how we expect them to work? Mm-hmm. Some of those current tools. And then, yeah, we're always interested in doing that type of exploratory work where we test new products mm-hmm. and using animal genetics, which is kind of mm, a way to potentially affect that little rumen microbiome world that lives within the cows indirectly by using genetic selection for those animals and trying to say, okay, if an animal's a low emitter, you know, is there a heritable component mm-hmm. of methane emissions and then select for animals that emit less methane in the future. Interesting. Which, which one of those do you see more potential, Sarah? Like, it's, it's the feed additive, is the feed processing, is the genetics? Yeah. I think it depends on the scale and what mm-hmm. segment of the industry we talk about, right? Mm-hmm. I think globally, going back to that conversation about productivity and efficiency, that's actually the biggest lever we probably have to pull around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, in, say, like a feedlot, probably our biggest opportunity is some sort of feed additive, mm-hmm. right? But if we think about like the grazing segments of the beef industry, genetics is a very attractive selection or option, right? Because, mm-hmm. you know, you can create a reduction, hopefully, and not have to have an increased input cost where you're trying to feed some sort of supplement to animals on a daily basis, right? So, um, and there's no reason why they can't be used in combination, right? Hopefully. Why not select yeah. for animals that are low emitters and then also use other technologies? Mm-hmm. Great. I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit about some of the challenges with this kind of research. What makes it, um, just in your perspective as a, as a researcher, what makes it just challenging to, to fully understand? Yeah, so I think there's still a lot that we don't know or all the interplays across these different scales of biology that we've been talking about, right? Like mm-hmm. how does the rumen microbiome interact with the animal and mm-hmm. vice versa, mm-hmm. right? We make kind of broad assumptions, but we have a lot of variation from animal to animal. And so some of the challenges is is just making sure we have enough animals represented per treatment to find differences that are Mm -hmm. sometimes relatively small. Mm -hmm. Um, And then just the challenges of every step in the process, right, of doing a good job of collecting Mm -hmm. the data and making sure that equipment is Mm -hmm. functioning properly. Mm -hmm. And I think a bigger picture issue is making sure there's funding to keep all the people Mm -hmm. whole that are... uh, Mm -hmm as a part of the process because um, mm-hmm. there's actually pretty limited federal funding mm-hmm. on enteric methane emission research. Mm-hmm. So we've often taken the strategy of working with industry to make sure we can address the issues that they're facing mm-hmm. right, and reducing methane emissions. That's, right. that's a great point. The, the variation is something that I, I've learned recently. Mm-hmm. I yes. was just going to ask a question about that. Yeah. So the variation is something that I, I think I've learned recently. So yeah. can, can you expand, and you've mentioned this, can you expand a little bit about how much variation exists? Like, do we do we know how much methane cattle actually produce? Or, I mean, we are trying to do some studies understanding that. How? What do you think about this? Yeah, so kind of on average, I think we, our models today probably do a pretty decent job, right, mm-hmm. of saying animals that are eating more forage emit more methane, animals that are eating... Um, higher energy diets and less forage. So, for example, across all of our finishing cattle studies, you know, animals are probably emitting anywhere from 140 to 180 grams per day, depending on how much they're eating. Gram, you know, 454 grams is a pound, right, to Mm -hmm. try to give you an idea of how much that is. And then when we're out measuring methane emissions from smaller animals that are not eating as much, but they're eating a 100% grass diet, they tend to be making 240 250, 260 grams per day, right? So they make more methane when they're eating grass than when Mm -hmm. they're eating a diet with high concentrate. But the variation, as you're asking, is huge, right? So that may be the mean, but around the mean, there's a lot of variation. So that's what we found is like within pens of animals that are all eating the exact same diet and animals that maybe even have the exact same feed intake and roughly the same body size, we can find animals with 50% plus different methane emissions, right? Which makes it really complicated when you try to have a baseline and then yes. add to fully understand reduction of potential or opportunity. Yes. Yeah. And that's where the, the variation is kind of frustrating from an experimental standpoint, but the genetic standpoint is exciting because if there's that much variation within a population of animals, there's probably opportunities to select for animals that are lower emitters. Mm-hmm. Right? So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I'm also curious to ask, why is this research so important? <laughs> 
Why is it important? Why is it so important? Yeah. Well, I think it's back to that bigger picture, right? Climate change is real. Methane is one of the greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. While cattle may not be a huge source, they're one of the small sources. And if we're going to make progress on it, we got to create reductions across all sources. right? And I think this research is important because we're trying to think about it from a standpoint of being practical, too. Mm -hmm. And think about, Mm -hmm. okay, we could come up with a great technical solution, but if it's too hard for somebody to implement on their Mm -hmm. operation because it's going to add labor costs or it's going to be too costly, then it's not really a solution, Mm -hmm. right? And so I think Can you talk more about that? Yeah. Yeah, please do. Yeah. (laughs) So I think the key thing there is, you know, thinking about resources that we have. One of those is our feed out of calculator tool, fact, Mm -hmm. for For beef. beef. Mm -hmm. And that is... Dairy is coming soon. Facts for dairy is coming soon. And that is directly related to that question of trying to figure out, kind of triangulate, if you will. Yeah. How much does a feed out of cost? What are your production costs? And what are you going to receive in terms of like a carbon price premium or some other premium as a producer? And what makes sense for you, right? Mm-hmm. So if a feed additive costs 15 cents per head per day, you can use that tool to figure out, you know, where's my break even or how much do I got to get paid to actually make this make sense mm-hmm. on my operation? Yep. Assuming, again, a feed additive has been proven, been safe, all those other things. Yeah, it's met it's all a those. Th- it's a theoretical yes, exercise. Yes, high level. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, Thank you. One of the things, and uh, we've talked about those feed additives, we've talked about understanding the baseline. Uh, one of the things that I hear quite often is the, the term additionality. Mm-hmm. And what does that mean when we're talking about these feed additives? Like you just mentioned fact. It's yeah. a really good tool to calculate that. But what does additionality mean? Yeah, so we kind of think about that term additionality, which sometimes it doesn't sound like a real word, but it <laughs> is, of... Um, and often in the context of like carbon markets mm-hmm. and greenhouse gas, like reduction protocols or other protocols to demonstrate you're cr- creating, right, mm-hmm. uh, carbon credits or carbon offsets or insets, whatever it may be. So additionality just means you have to show an additional change over whatever your baseline is. There's other criteria in mm-hmm. some of these protocols where it's like a certain percentage of the industry has adopted a technology. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And then, you know, once it gets above that threshold, you can no longer claim that you're making a difference, right? This, those are kind of arbitrary rules. But the, the basics of it is back to the reality of, like, methane concentrations are increasing the atmosphere. Mm-hmm. Like, you got to do something if mm-hmm. you're going to get paid that actually Reduce. materially affects that in terms of reducing emissions. And are there currently incentives in the marketplace for, well, I guess there's currently no real additive option. On the enteric side, it's pretty sparse. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Because of that. Um, the place where it comes into play is more on manure. Right? Okay. Yes. And methane emissions that come from manure. Okay. So because you're talking about manure, we've... Yeah. We've I know we kind of transitioned from enteric methane to manure. Yeah, so it, do we want to just jump well, yeah, and talk I, about I, that? I think, I think we, it's it, good. But I think that's also a good point because we've spent a lot of time talking about beef, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So is methane coming from an important in the beef industry or more in the dairy so yeah. Can, so should manure, we make that transition? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if we think about methane sources, right, we've been talking about enteric, 3.1%. Mm-hmm. But there's another 1% of methane mm-hmm. that is coming from uh, manure. Mm-hmm. Okay. But most of that is coming from dairy mm-hmm. systems and swine systems, not from beef systems. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the reason that is, is just the way we manage the animals and manage their manure. Mm-hmm. Right? So, like, within that... Rumen, um, a key constituent of like what the environment needs to be for that animal to make methane is it's got to be oxygen free. So inside mm-hmm. the gut, it's oxygen free. Mm-hmm. The methanogens mm-hmm. love life and they produce lots of methane. As soon as they get exposed to air, they will die, basically. Um, mm-hmm. And so um, that's that's why for beef systems, the way we manage manure, it's almost always just deposited on the ground. Whether we're in feedlot pens mm-hmm. or grazing, the manure is exposed to air. And so methanogens can't take off and can't mm, really produce much methane. Um, when we think about dairy systems and again, swine systems, that's like where we have manure that can potentially be in a so-called anaerobic environment, okay. being oxygen-free. Right? So they may have a manure storage system or mm-hmm. a lagoon or whatever it may be. That manure is stored in that area. Well, now we have an oxygen-free environment. There's organic matter. Methanogens are like, yeah, this is great. Mm-hmm. Right? So then they can grow. Um, but it varies depending upon lot of factors still mm-hmm. right um a big one is the temperature mm-hmm. so 
kind of like with all biological activity, when it gets cold, if it's below zero, and if you're a dairy farm in you know northern Minnesota or something, and you mm-hmm. have a lagoon mm-hmm. in the wintertime, you're probably not emitting very much methane because okay. there's not a lot of biological activity. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you're in you know, southern Central Valley of California and it's warm all the time, mm-hmm. your ability to produce methane out of a manure lagoon is higher. So that's where it's mm-hmm. tricky. It's like how much for any individual farm of their methane is coming from enteric sources mm-hmm. versus manure really varies depending on how they manage your manure mm-hmm. and what kind of climate they're in. So some, yeah. some dairies in California, they may have just as much or more methane coming from their manure systems than they do from enteric from their cows. Mm-hmm. In other places, it's mm-hmm. totally swapped. just depends. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And, yeah, I'm just curious, like, on, on the mit- mitigation strategies. What are, the, what are the mitigation strategies for the dairy side? I think most of the ones that we talk for beef for enteric, I believe they would apply for dairy yeah, as well. exactly. What about the, the manure? Yeah, so on the manure side, right, if kind of building upon what we just talked about, right, mm-hmm. air exposure kills methanogens. So Mm -hmm. if you manage manure in a way that allows for, say, composting, which ideally, if it's managed properly as a process, right, you're going to have a lot of air exposure to the manure that Mm -hmm. should have a lot lower um, methane emissions. But oftentimes dairies are larger and maybe they're cattle are in barns and they use, say, like a flush system. So the the water and Mm -hmm. content of the manure Mm -hmm. is much higher. So that's where lagoons are oftentimes used. Mm -hmm. But there are different ways of, say, separating manure solids out and then, say, mm-hmm. composting those solids. Or a big thing in the industry today is using anaerobic digestion. Right? Mm-hmm. There's a lot of interest in that. And this is where it's kind of counterintuitive. In anaerobic digestion, you're not trying to stop methane production. You're actually trying yeah. to enhance it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but you're doing it in a controlled way, right, depending mm-hmm. on the digester design. And you're capturing that biogas. Um, and you're making sure it doesn't go to the atmosphere. You're trying to capture it for useful purposes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Could be combusted on site for electricity generation if you got like a turbine engine that's there. Okay. Um, or you could try to refine it, clean it, which happens a lot now. And basically take that biogas and turn it into methane mm-hmm. that can be used for natural gas mm-hmm. and put it into natural gas pipelines. Um, so there's several dairies around the country where they have those type of setups where they're basically taking the dairy manure creating methane purposefully, cleaning, scrubbing the methane because there's other gases and it's not just pure mm-hmm. methane, but getting it to a pretty high degree of purity and then injecting it right into mm-hmm. pipelines that, quite frankly, you may have used dairy methane, you know, in your house to run your stove and you didn't know it, right? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. That's pretty good. Can yeah. be a solution. Yes. Yeah. So I feel like I've spoken with a couple of dairy farmers here in northern Colorado that have recently installed um, anaerobic digesters. It's been an interesting opportunity for them. Yeah. They've mentioned. Yeah. So from an economic standpoint, there's been policies, especially in the state of California, that have really driven um, an increase in the amount of anaerobic digesters in the dairy industry and some in the swine industry. But yeah. So I know that you um, have been studying this topic for years, your entire career, basically. Um, I'm curious to know... um, what are some of the most industry, interesting interesting um, strategies that you've heard um, for methane mitigation in animal ag? Just I like things mm. that have come up and be like, oh, you want to try this? Um, I know seaweed People's. is not something that folks typically think of when they think of cattle. Um, so that's one, but I'm just curious to hear. Well, I just saw a paper, I haven't had a chance to read it, where people were trying to say, can we take like inside a barn, like a confined barn, and try to like, basically break down the methane before it exits the barn, oh. right? Like use like How a, do do kind of like a catalytic converter process, right? Okay. Of trying to remove the methane from the atmosphere after it's already been emitted from the cow. So instead of trying to mess with the microbial ecosystem, okay. let it all happen. And then can you do something in the environment to try to break the methane down before it gets released? Um, there's another company that tries or purports to do that with a wearable technology for the animal. Oh, um, like it just captures it like from, the, like it's on their, kind it's of on their face. Like so the pictures I've seen of it, right? It kind of yeah. looks like a halter and this device oh, is on okay. the animal's face and the same concepts. Mm-hmm. I've not seen any data to support that, but it's an interesting yeah, idea, right? Of like, I think could what, you do that? Yeah, I think, you know, the technology that you're describing is 
innovation in the industry to say, hey, we're working on this. We're trying to yeah. figure this out. Mm-hmm. And here, it, well, let's try it, right? Um, yeah. So I think yeah. that's pretty cool too. Yeah. I can think we, we can think of a lot of challenges of that approach, right? But to not shoot it down, that's one of the things that people are working on mm-hmm. as well. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm curious to, you know, what do you think is the potential of feed additives in the U.S.? And where do you think we go from here, you know, after after our conversation today? Mm, good question. Well, I think um, it's more likely that feed additives are going to get applied in the parts of the industry, beef and dairy, where we actually feed animals, mm-hmm. total mixed rations, right, in barns and facilities, not grazing cattle. Um, so if we look at it that way, you know, there's probably potential to affect directly in 30 40 percent of the enteric methane mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so if you could cut that down by you know 20 percent or plus mm-hmm. that's kind of gives you an idea of you know we're talking about maybe a reduction of like 11 to 15 percent of the total methane this is this is like very napkin math <laughs> yeah. in my this head is cowboy but <laughs> this napkin. is cowboy math cowboy to math. the extreme right but yeah. that would be kind of that potential right yeah. of what feed out because there are a lot do. of variables that go yeah. into operations what they're eating market there's, penetration mm-hmm. blah, 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 blah. yeah but but there's you know, potential kinda, yeah yeah so it it's exciting it definitely won't reduce emissions by 100 percent, and that's always that important thing too like mm-hmm. we're never going to reduce emissions by 100 mm-hmm. percent um, Why is that? Because of that microbial ecosystem, right? So mm-hmm. it's part of how a ruminant functions. It's a key yep. part of how they work. Um, it's also important to just take a step back and say, you know, like the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and their future projections of like how we can achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions, they never assume methane emissions are going to go to zero, nor nitrous oxide emissions, which mm-hmm. is a whole other topic. But because a lot of those emissions are coming from food production, and food production is not optional in society, mm. and things are never 100% efficient. Mm-hmm. So we can do things to reduce and try to be smart about it and try to not mm-hmm. negatively impact food security for people and the producers and the supply chain, mm-hmm. but you're never going to take those emissions to zero. You, you never want to say never, right? But this yeah. is one of those things you can be kind of confident in, like, we're never going to take methane emissions to zero. That's just true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Perfect. I, I think we have a good understanding, like to answer the, the listener's yeah, question. Yeah, the listener question. I feel we've, like we've got it. We've covered, let's say, diet mm-hmm. interventions, feed processing, grain, mm-hmm. forage. Fat. Fat. Genetics. Genetics, mm-hmm. feed additives. Mm-hmm. One point about genetics is if if we can do that, that's, that's something that we can implement permanent. permanent. Permanent reductions. That's mm-hmm. the one nice thing about genetics, right? Mm-hmm. It is a reduction forever, right? Theoretically. Mm-hmm. And cumulative, right? So theoretically, yeah. you ought to be able to make incremental improvement from generation to generation and keep driving it down to mm-hmm. whatever biological floor there mm-hmm. is. Yeah, But that will be a very slow process, right? Because it of will. the way of So that's back to your question about yeah. N- not what, that do we, that's bad. what do we it's just need? The process. Right, but. yeah. Anytime we take and we, anytime we want to do something with genetics, we have to collect a lot of actual, mm-hmm. what we call phenotypic data, like actual emissions from real live animals. Mm-hmm. And because methane is such a variable trait, it's like we have to collect thousands and thousands of records mm-hmm. of animals. Mm-hmm. And so that's just a costly and time-consuming process. So it's not that mm-hmm. we won't get there, but it's just... It just takes time. It takes a lot. It'll take time just to right-size expectations, yeah. No, I, I see... I see a lot of challenge. We've we've covered a lot of challenge here, like the variation, mm-hmm. how they would spawn, the time consuming, the food security. I think that's a big point. Like making sure that we are doing something that's not actually decreasing food production, right? We yeah, because it kind of comes back to the point about productivity. It's the flip side of that, right? Mm-hmm. So you can imagine a situation where you say, "Well, we reduced methane, but we also reduced m- milk production by ten or twenty percent." Mm-hmm. But you can think about what you didn't do which is affect global demand for milk, right? Mm-hmm. So it's not that people are going to consume less dairy products. We're just going to have to produce them more somewhere else or from more cows. Mm-hmm. So there's a potential for your reduction per animal to start eating into whole system efficiency, mm-hmm. which again, the, the arbiter of truth in this whole thing is the atmosphere, right? How much are we actually putting out on an annual basis mm-hmm. of methane? That's always the the truth teller in this, right? So mm-hmm. we can make all these changes, but if the whole system still ends up emitting more methane, then mm-hmm. we right. didn't make that much progress. Yeah. So we're just doing, we're focusing on our part of this research. Um, 
And yeah, I just want to give you a chance if there's anything else you'd want to add about this important topic, methane mitigation in beef and dairy. Yeah, I think it's it's a great opportunity for the industry, also a challenge. And mm-hmm. I think it's one of those things of just right-sizing expectations of there's a lot we still have to learn. Yep. And I think we should work on mitigating methane emissions, but I also think we cannot ignore this food security component of it Mm -hmm. and and making sure we weigh that methane emissions are just one slice of this bigger topic of a sustainable Mm -hmm. food system. So we have to look at the whole picture and make sure that we don't get methane tunnel vision, even though that's, I feel like most of my days spent talking about (laughs) methane. Well, it's your expertise. I also think it's important to not only focus on it because it's just one Mm -hmm. component. That yeah. makes sense. And it's important, like you said, to be realistic about the complexity of, of the system and doing the research. You may start the research today that you're going to have the answer 12 months from today. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we and don't have a lot of time between now and 2030 or now or all yeah. these 2050. Com- yeah. climate commitments are, mm-hmm. right? So that is the reality, too. It's like we, we need to get busy. Yeah, that's true. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Yeah. Any other questions, Pedro? No, I think we asked a lot of questions. I know. Questions. I think we covered a lot of good stuff about methane mitigation. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Thank you, listeners, for joining us for another episode of the Ag Next podcast. We're always excited to tell you about what's next from Ag Next. Just a reminder to follow us on social media and stay tuned for future opportunities for listener pick podcasts. We would love to have your input. Um, and also always open to feedback and suggestions. So if you f- feel free to email us at agnext at colostate.edu. Thank you.